Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's so exciting to see everyone here. Please take your seats. My name is Rachel Mizuno. I'm the director of Next Generation here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you for joining us this evening. The council is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent the institutional positions or views of the council. Right. Um, well, this event is on the record and we are live streaming, so we welcome your social media engagement. Please do share on social media what your thoughts are and some of your questions. Later, we'll be taking audience questions from the audience here in, in the room, but also the audience online joining us uh, uh, via live stream. So thank you and welcome to all of you. We'll be taking those questions also via uh, our online system, you, which you can see on the screen, but I'll, I'll give it to you here, chi.cnf.io. This is our system for taking questions. Now, turning back to tonight's program. I'm really looking forward to a robust conversation about education in a global context, and look forward to hearing from some of our, uh, the second class of Cold Light Global Teachers. Our five teachers um, I'd like to introduce. Katie Hollerbach, who is a teacher at Limbloom Math and Science Academy. She's in the back, you will meet her in a moment. Daniel Kovacs, who is a teacher at Jones College Prep. You wanna wave, Daniel? Griffin Muckley, a teacher at Christ the King Jesuit College Preparatory School, also in the back. Elise Scarberry, a teacher at Eric Solorio Academy High School. And Valerie Wadicki, a teacher at Lakeview High School. You wave, Valerie, thanks. These five extraordinary educators have traveled the globe and bringing, class, uh, bringing lessons back to the cl their classrooms in Chicago. Their trips were made possible by the generous support of Mike and Patricia Koldike, who've been great friends to the council over the years. The Koldike Global Teacher Program aims to integrate global education into public and parochial classrooms in Chicago instilling an in understanding and appreciation of global affairs in the next generation of future leaders. An honorary life director at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Pat has spent years furthering awareness and understanding of international affairs in Chicago. Her husband, Mike, is a recognized leader in education and educational reform. He's the founder and chairman emeritus of the Golden Apple Foundation for Excellence in Teaching and the Academy for Urban School Leadership. Pat and Mike are both extremely important and valued leaders in Chicago and in the council for their creativity and commitment to strengthening educational opportunities for the next generation. They're also incredible thought leaders and partners with us in this work of expanding um, global education in the city and also the state. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mike Koldike to the stage now, and I welcome to welcome all of you here tonight. Thanks. Frank Pixero Sims. Well, the traffic doesn't keep you away after all. The buildings are falling down, and cabs are dropping us over by the lake, but you made it beautifully. Congratulations. Um, I must tell you, I'm uh, I'm always, uh, I feel uh, honored and privileged to be in the presence of, of teachers, educators that are every day making a fundamental difference in the lives of so many children. This, uh, this business of ours with the Council on Global Affairs is really in honor of my wife, Pat, uh, a, beautiful, a beautiful wife for over 50 years, a sufferer of Alzheimer's, uh, like many others, but uh, she has had a remarkable life. And back in the 80s, uh, she, um, we had started the Golden Apple Foundation after watching the Oscar Awards, and one said to the other, those should be teachers up there. And that led me to go to Arnie Weber, the new president of Northwestern, and to Bill McCarter, who was the relatively new president of WTTW Channel 11. They had to listen to me because I was on their board, but, uh, <laughs> but they didn't have to do it. Uh, and God bless them, they did. And so for 32 years, teachers have been honored on 
WTTW, and they spend, uh, the Golden Apple teachers spend the uh, spring uh, sabbatical uh, at the university. Pat's work uh, in education, she's a lay person, uh, but, uh, by the, but despite that, she um, led the first, the very first class of Golden Apple Scholars of Illinois. Black and brown and a couple of white kids, there were 15 of them. And they were the very first class. We've graduated over 1,500 teachers in the Golden Apple Scholars of Illinois program, and we have 700 or 600 in training right now. That program will only grow and enlarge and be a bigger factor in the state of Illinois as, as it goes forward. So this dedication of teachers by the council and to afford them an opportunity to see firsthand how teachers are working in other parts of the world comes to us um, fittingly and fits the history of what you've taught us. We know this world is in kind of a mess. I had lunch today with a very distinguished Chicago jurist. His name is Newton Minow. He was the uh, he goes way back to President John F. Kennedy when he was appointed. He found the phrase about television, the vast wasteland. He's remarkable, a remarkable Chicago and a remarkable American. He said to me today, I'm deeply worried about the country. God forbid. If Newt Minow's worried, we better all get to work. So the work that you're doing and that you will do by traveling abroad and, and by encouraging and, and then taking this work back to your kids is work that will be honored, uh, I'll bet in heaven, but certainly here on earth and in Chicago. Um, this is our second year, and this, we set a group of Chicago teachers around the world to deepen their knowledge of global education models, and bring cross-cultural experiences back to their classrooms. Chicago is home to an incredible network of people who care about shaping globally-minded students, from civic leaders to Mayor Rahm's office and a variety of nonprofits. New partnerships and resources are becoming available to, this, to support global competence efforts. In response to this, teachers in Chicago and beyond have been working hard to prepare students to engage in cross-cultural concepts. The teachers on stage this evening are doing their part in preparing future global citizens. Our 2017 class of Koldyke Global Teachers traveled to Morocco, Hungary, France, Chile, South Africa, and the UK. They were smart to begin with, and they're wonderful teachers. But that experience of seeing firsthand how their, how their contemporary educators in these other countries are faring and working to produce a world that is, with God's help, more peaceful, more prosperous, and more deeply caring. That, after all, is what it's all about. Before we welcome our panel, I'm pleased to introduce two of our cold eye teachers who will deliver brief flash talks about their personal experiences abroad. First, Elise Scarberry is a teacher at Solorio Academy High School. That, by the way, is one of AUSL's schools, so it makes it doubly exciting for me, for us. And she'll discuss her experience of traveling to Europe. She'll be followed by Griffin Muckley, who is a teacher at Christ the King Jesuit College Preparatory School and he will discuss his trip to South Africa. Please join me in welcoming Elise Scarberry. Good evening. As Mr. Koldyke said, my name is Elise Scarberry, and I'm a teacher at Eric Solorio Academy High School in Gage Park. This past summer, I had the privilege of traveling to Budapest, Paris, and London as a part of the Coldike Global Teacher Program. Within my time at Solorio, 
Immigration and acceptance have been major themes, not only in my teaching, but also in the relationships that I have built with my students, their families, and my school's community. Many of my students are immigrants to the United States, some of whom are undocumented or whose families are undocumented. I have witnessed firsthand the trauma and anxiety that immigration policies have on the lives of youth and their families. I have also witnessed how our current political climate has caused tension and raised questions of what future life will be like. While my students are focused on the immediate safety within their communities, a theme of othering and rejecting those unlike ourselves is spreading across the globe. With my Coldite Global Teacher Grant, I was able to meet with humanitarian and non-governmental organizations to discuss their work with migrants and refugees and how they are navigating this ever-changing climate. In my travels to Budapest, Paris, and London, I learned that many of the experiences of European migrants mirror those of my undocumented students and their families. Both groups face instability in work and living situations, discrimination, and blame for their community's economic and social problems. While the specifics of policies and situations varied throughout my travels, overall, there were significant trends of increasing hostility towards immigrants. In Hungary, almost all relations between the government and asylum and refugee supporting organizations have been frozen. In Paris, I found some support for undocumented migrants, but also a lot of concern about how the increase in far-right politics in France has emboldened anti-immigrant sentiments within the country, making people feel more comfortable to be outspoken. Of all the locations that I visited, London provided the most parallels to our current immigration situation. As in the United States, there are a lot of misunderstandings around how people end up undocumented within the country. This has led to the creation of an intentional hostile environment towards immigrants, where harsh immigration policies have been put in place to limit the access to housing, employment, healthcare, and education. Based on what I learned through my travels, this year I planned and taught a unit in which students looked at migration globally to understand why people leave their homes and what happens when they end up in a new place. I thought it very important for my students to understand that globally there are refugees who are forced to leave their homes and migrants who choose to leave their homes. Within this unit, my students learned about how governments and citizens react when people arrive in a new country and also about organizations that exist to support and advocate for migrants and refugees. Through their learning, students were able to understand reasons why people may react negatively to an influx of migrants and refugees and how to advocate for more inclusive policies. It was my hope that by analyzing, comparing, and dissecting the situations across the globe, my students would begin to develop approaches for how to change the narrative within the United States and beyond. Overall, because of my new learning and subsequent planning, students were able to understand that immigration is an issue that not only impacts members of their community and people here in the United States, but that this is a global issue where many parallels can be drawn. At this point in our history, the decision of whether to accept or reject immigrants and refugees is at the forefront of our politics. My Coldike Global Teacher Grant allowed me to gain firsthand knowledge, to plan an effective unit that holistically addresses this issue, and to bring the world to my students. When teachers are given an opportunity like this, it motivates us to stay fresh, and it challenges us to continue to improve our practice. I will forever be grateful for this experience, and I would like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Coldike and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for providing me with the means to learn, grow, and positively impact the lives of my students. Thank you. Please welcome Griffin Muckley to the stage. Hi. Like they said, my name is Griffin Muckley, and I teach uh, world literature at Christ the King Jesuit College Preparatory School in the Austin and Garfield Park neighborhood. Um, 
a little bit else about me. Uh, okay. <laughs> In addition to teaching world literature, um, I also coach our mock trial team as well as our spoken word poetry team. Um, in my own time, I like to play a little bit of Ultimate Frisbee, and I'm a writer. And uh, I'll actually be getting married uh, this July to my fiance, who's in the, in the audience. I'm gonna wave. <laughs> so this summer, I was able to go to South Africa um, to look. I was able to go to South Africa um, with the intention of looking at education in the townships, so the segregated neighborhoods outside of the cities that were meant for black Africans and that still experience um, poverty, immense poverty today. But when I got there, what I realized was what was more important was actually just listening to the stories of the people who lived through the history that I wanted to look at. So for instance, I spoke with many people, both teachers uh, and just other people who were in school at the time of the Bantu Education Act. So when they were in school, they had to learn uh, in the language Afrikaans, not their native Kosa or Zulu. And what that led to eventually was these Soweto, Soweto youth riots. And these riots, um, getting to walk down the streets of Soweto where they took place, made me think of the agency that these kids had in bringing South Africa to a global stage. And I wanted to be able to bring that back to show my students that kids their age are able to do the exact same thing. Um, and lastly, being able to go to historical sites and uh, places like the Apartheid Museum to learn about uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and really understand Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela's uh, vision to bring their country back together instead of tear, tear it apart or to imprison those who were oppressing them um, really made me think of a new perspective that I wanted to bring back to my kids. And so I had two essential questions uh, when I came back to my classroom. I wanted to look at how and why people are divided with my kids through literature, but then also look at how can we successfully reunite people as well. I wanted them to be able to look at uh, their experiences and the shared experiences that they had um, with students who were going through apartheid. Um, I should probably go back, and if you're not familiar, uh, the Austin and Garfield Park neighborhoods are majority African American, um, and so that was the connection I saw with a lot of my students. And so I wanted them to be able to look at this through a lens of solution-based problem solving. So not just looking at the issues, but how those issues were solved. And finally, also looking at the root causes through the literature that we would read together. And so what I took, uh, hmm. that might help. So. What I was able to look at um, with them was first the novel Things Fall Apart, which does not take place in South Africa, it takes place in Nigeria, but I was able to introduce the idea of imperialism with them. Europeans who came to Africa in order to um, take power and how they destroyed a culture in the meantime. Uh, after that, we were able to segue into some uh, first-hand accounts through NPR of the Soweto youth riots. Uh, which was allowed them to do some inquiry as well as some research on their own in order to introduce the topic of apartheid. Then from there we looked at excerpts of Nelson Mand uh, sorry, of Trevor Noah's autobiography, Born a Crime. Uh, in it, the chapters that we looked at, he chronicles his life growing up with a black mother and a white father and how at the time of apartheid that was essentially illegal. Um, and so he navigates it using language and humor in order to uh, make connections with other people. And then finally, we were able to look at excerpts of a few Nelson Mandela speeches in order to look at his trajectory and how he finally arrived at his conclusion of coming together instead of separating. And so with their final unit, what, or for their final project, what they did was they made a podcast from the perspective of different characters that we had encountered, looking at Africa and division and how to bring uh, communities back together. And then they also wrote a final essay. And this is an excerpt uh, from one of my students, and I'd like to leave you with this. Even though overcoming differences is not easy, there are many ways of doing it, and over time, a gap between people will become smaller and smaller. And things fall apart when Mr. Brown talked with another Umofian about religion. He began to understand why they believed what they believed. Unlike others, Mr. Brown was actually took the time to understand the other people's perspective. Another example in the, is the book Born a Crime. Trevor's mother taught him different languages so that he could understand all different types of people. This helped him a lot when he was in school or just outside the house. She went into detail in both of those examples, but 
before I started this project, I don't know if I could have given a succinct definition of what a globally minded student was. And it was after I read some of my students' essays that I really realized that to be a globally minded student was this. It was to use the tools you have, like language, to bring people together instead of tear them apart. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel to the stage. Thank you, Elise and Griffin, um, for your stories, powerful stories from your experiences, Cold Lake Global Teachers and also in your classroom. I have the pleasure to introduce our panel. I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, so sitting next to me is Katie Hellerbeck. She's a 2017 Cold Lake Global Teacher and a teacher at Lindblom Math and Science Academy. Sitting next to her is Randy Smith, who's the co-founder of the Illinois Global Scholar Certificate Program, a teacher in Naperville um, Central High School. And Kate Ireland, who is the founding director of global education at the District of Columbia Public School System. So I have a lot of questions for all of you. Um, we are living in an incredibly complex and globalized world. Um, there are a lot of ways in which teachers have access to that world and students have direct access to that world. But you know, today we're gonna have a conversation about how students are responding to that globalized world, how classrooms are responding to that, that work, and how we can all uh, promote access to global education uh, no matter what classroom or school you're in. So Katie, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. You're also a Cold Egg Global teacher and traveled this summer. Um, studying and looking at youth homelessness and the effects of colonialism on Morocco. Um, can you talk a little bit about your findings and the impact that they've had in your classroom? Sure. Um, so I really appreciated both Elise and Griffin mentioned this idea of being solutions minded. Um, and that was certainly an important part of my research as well. Um, so I was creating a unit for a new class that we're teaching at Limbloom, um, and it's kind of a mix between a thematic modern world history class and a civics class. I think sometimes we think of civics as belonging within U.S. history, um, but I see a real opportunity to kind of combine the two so that students are becoming global citizens, and that I think should go beyond just being aware of other cultures and should also be like learning from how individuals and groups are creating positive change in their communities across the world. So I was there studying youth homelessness, not just the issue itself, although I was able to meet people who had experienced it. Um, one person who really stood out to me, he was 21 when I met him, um, but he, and he was in his last year of university, he was learning his fifth language, but he was homeless as a child and had then grown up in this orphanage. Um, and it was so powerful for me to see his story and how that had changed um, for him. So I was also able to then be in touch with different organizations that were addressing this issue, that were advocating for this issue in terms of creating change. So I was able to look at the French role in terms of French nonprofits as a former colonial power. Um, I visited community centers, orphanages, um, and it was really great to see p these people who were kind of finding these really creative solutions to this issue. So then bringing all that back to my students, um, the model of this class that we're teaching is in the first semester we did country case studies looking at how people are creating change in different communities across the globe. And the Morocco unit, um, we started by introducing the issue and then learned the history and culture of the country for about a month. Um, because I think it's really important to consider that when thinking about what solutions might be best for an issue like this. Um, and I remember the last day, uh, it was the last day before winter break, which those of you teachers in the audience know it's not the most focused time for students. Um, but they were so invested in this discussion that we were having about which of the four solutions that we proposed to them they thought would be most effective that they discussed right up until the class was over and wanted to stay a little bit after. Um, and it was just really great for me to see how much they truly cared about you know, this place that in many ways feel, can feel very far away. But mm -hmm. I think because of the stories and connections I was able to share with them, it felt a bit you know, more urgent and closer to home. Mm -hmm. Kate, uh, turning away from Illinois for a moment to the District of Columbia, uh, obviously a very unique and global community. You have the embassies, you have um, you know, the seat of 
power lots of national and, and global and international in, uh, organizations. What are some examples of the globally focused programs that you provide your students in DC? Yeah, absolutely. So we had an opportunity about three and a half years ago to start a global education team and we're very unique in that way. That is not something that you commonly find in public districts. Um, we have a team of five and we started this team for two reasons. A, to really capitalize on the global nature of our city um, with a recognition that it really is essential and an imperative to ensure that our students are globally competent, right? If we're gonna make sure they are successful in college, career, and life, and able to effectively communicate, um, we need to make sure that they understand what it is to understand and recognize diverse perspectives, communicate across differences, take action on different <coughs> ideas. Um, so that was a one key piece for us. The second key piece was equity of access. And um, since we're in Chicago and not in DC, a little background on our school district. Um, we're a small school district. We serve about 50,000 students across 115 schools. Over 80% of our students are students of color and 76% of our students are economically disadvantaged. And so we are working with students who have traditionally been far from global opportunity. Um, for us, that means ensuring that every student has access to world language instruction. And so we now start world language instruction in kindergarten for all of our students with seven target languages offered across the district. Um, we have a long-standing um, program, Embassy Adoption Program, where we do partner with our embassy friends. Um, and we have over 80 embassies working together with fifth and sixth grade classrooms throughout the year to teach students about different perspectives and cultures. Um, we have a fully funded study abroad program that we started for our eighth and 11th grade students. And that was um, to really, again, counter this narrative around who has access to global opportunities. Uh, when you look at the national statistics of who is studying abroad, um, and you look at what we are doing in DC, it's really changing um, what that looks like in terms of numbers. So um, for us, it, it was those two pieces, knowing that this is an imperative um, and wanting to, to ensure that equity of access. So mm -hmm. um, through those different programs, that's how we've been able to start establishing this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Randy, you serve as the co-founder of uh, the Illinois Global Scholar Certificate Program along with this, the in Famous, not infamous, <laughs> Seth Brady. Um, why is a certificate so important to Illinois and our students here? So it's interesting when I was hearing about different education experiences. Um, had the opportunity a few years ago to spend some time in Finland looking at the Finnish education system. It's gotten a lot of press, <laughs> right? And so, hey, let's go and study that. And one of the things that I thought was exciting to hear from Finnish educators was how they felt empowered. Um, and so to me, what's exciting in terms of Illinois Global Scholar Certificate is it's really been a, a teacher-driven initiative in the state of Illinois. Now, one that's exciting, that's empowering, um, the impact, right? It's one of those things that's yet to be seen, but as my colleague and I um, kind of had an idea, had a passion, but as we started, we went to, you open up a lot of doors by saying, can you give me some input on something? So as we talked to people in business, as we talked to other people in education, and we said, hey, here's some things we're thinking about regarding developing global competencies in a future workforce and college and career ready mm -hmm. people. And the resounding response was, yes, this is important, this is needed, this is what I want in a future employer. And, and honestly, for, for us, it's what we want in people, right? Who are rich, who can see diverse perspectives, who take action. Um, the certificate, in a nutshell, has four key components eight globally focused courses, a global collaboration or dialogue component, globally focused service learning component, and then a capstone piece that is really, if you think about it, kind of an individual research project. But it's more than that because you take a compelling and actionable question related to a global con issue or concern. You research that, thinking kind of informational but also opportunities for solution, but then you take your research and you share that with people who have on the ground experience with that issue. They provide, in a sense, a mentorship and feedback to you. So that what you're getting is that informed response from people that this would actually be targeted towards. And then what students do is in that dialogue process come up with, in a sense, an action component. Uh, and that's been the exciting part is to see how this is transformative for young men and young women. Uh, and so as a concept, Illinois Global Scholar is young, but we look at something that has the capacity to raise our state as a whole. So. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, you know, we know that some of the early statistics and data from DC um, that you've been able to garner, Kate, has said that 
you know, students who participate in globally focused education have higher rates of soft skills coming out of school. Um, and we know that, you know, preparing students for whether it's work or life uh, in a multicultural context is really imperative. So, Katie, I know you have some students in the audience tonight. What are some of the ways in which you've been, hi guys. <laughs> um, what are some of the ways in which you've been able to really contextualize global events or current affairs for your students in the classroom? So something that's come up a lot in my classes this year as we're learning world history is what would this look like if we were in a classroom on the other side of the world? How mm -hmm. would they be learning this narrative? How would it be different? Mm -hmm. um, and I think across all my classes, always making sure that when we're talking about events, whether they're current or in the past, that we're considering multiple perspectives. And I think that becomes a lot easier when I have kind of like personal experiences to draw on and I can say like, well, my friend who I met in Morocco or my former teacher who lives in Paris, I think it just gives a more real sense to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, that's been really, something that's been really powerful for them. I know you also, your school has one of the largest, if not the largest Arabic yeah. uh, language yeah. programs in the country. And I think I remember you saying that you also met up with one of your former students when you were in Morocco. I did, yes. Uh, Adam, who's here, studied in Morocco last summer. Um, and Alicia is going uh, this summer as well. And Adam will be going to Jordan. And I think like if, if I could speak for you guys, um, the way that studying Arabic, and our school also offers Chinese, yeah. has just opened doors for, uh, for these students is really impressive. And I really credit our world language uh, program for that too. Yeah. Um, but, and I really enjoy learning from them. I was telling Adam on the way here, I can't wait to hear about Jordan, so. Yeah. Randy, I've had the chance to meet some of the Illinois Global Scholars, the ones that most recently awarded as of, I think, yesterday. They as would have yesterday. received their awards. What have you noticed about those students that have participated in, in the program over time and how have they reacted? Yeah, um, I think a couple things. One is <coughs> there's things in school you can fake, right? <laughs> You don't can't, do you can't, <laughs> don't do it. But, but the idea that, that Walking through a, a rigorous process that the capstone is, um, developing the soft skills, developing these research skills, learning how to talk with people across cultural boundaries, um, and then learning how to put your learning into a context that would serve in a different culture and have value, um, is is just the, the you know the epitome of I guess of developing global competencies. Um, but what we've also seen in our students is just a growing confidence that. Mm -hmm they're able to approach a situation and, and talk with a greater level of confidence. Uh, we had some students who today, earlier in the day here, was a series of stakeholders involved with Illinois Global Scholar and a broader thing called the Illinois Global Education Network. And we had a few of those Illinois Global Scholars come. And just to see them have voice among adults uh, was really cool. And to see them have, have significant and valued input because of their experiences is a really rich and rewarding gift that they are going to be and to see They've caught the bug, and it's a good bug to catch. And they they want to continue with this. Uh, I feel like we're always making asks of them, and they're doing it willingly because mm -hmm. something's changed inside who they are, and they're a richer human being for that. Mm -hmm. So, Kate, you've partnered with GW, GW University, George Washington University um, in DC, and have been funded to to really do some intensive impact analysis on your programs there in DC. Can you share some of your findings with? Absolutely. Um, our audience. Before I do that, I do want to just echo what Randy said about his students. It just incredible in terms of the the level uh, to which they can speak about these different global issues. And I think everybody who was in this room today, uh, a lot of long term professionals were talking about how they were speaking yeah. like doctoral students. Yeah. <laughs> um, and these are students who have yet to leave high school. So really incredible, incredibly impressive group of kiddos. Um, in terms of the work that we've done um, and, and the impact we are seeing. Um, we're seeing really exciting pieces both on the soft skill side and then also on the, the hard data. And one of the first phone calls that we made when we uh, learned that we had funding for study abroad, um, which is taking hundreds of students abroad. This year we'll send about 460 students abroad fully funded. Um, and yeah, so in the past three years, it's 1,400 students and educators um, in three years time. And that is at no cost to the students. 
Um, but one of the first calls that we made was to George Washington University and to Dr. Engel, um, who we had collaborated with on a couple other projects, because we knew that um, we knew that eventually private funding would run out, and we knew that we would need to be able to make the story um, and the case for this through data. We are a data-driven district, as I think we all are living in, um, and we knew that it was going to be important for that longevity, but also it was an opportunity because we know that it is a gift that we've been able to take this many students abroad, that we've been able to develop a team of this size, and we want to be able to show empirically what is the impact of, of this type of program. Um, and the results have been phenomenal. Um, and the, the year two evaluation is actually just published today by GW, it's online. Um, but we are seeing that students, uh, on, on the trips, uh, students are traveling with students from across our city. So a single trip may re be reflective of 10 different high schools within DC. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe it's 96% of our students come back talking about their increased ability to make friends across different um, cultural differences. And those might be the cultural differences they experience abroad, but it's also the cultural differences within our city. Um, we're very much a city divided, as I think is true of many urban areas. Um, and so developing that capacity has been significant increased motivation for learning and for school, um, increased desire to study abroad and to work abroad, um, and really an interest in investing more in their world language um, instruction. And uh, some of them are noting that they aren't where they wanted to be in terms of their world language proficiency, um, and this has given them that additional motivation to continue. Um, so that has been incredibly exciting. On the, the real hard data side, we've also seen exciting college and career outcomes. So DC Best Study Abroad does not select based on any academic performance. We never look at GPA, we never look at enrollment in courses. Um, our students who do participate versus their peers who do not are more likely to, um, to apply to more colleges. They are on average um, completing FAFSA at extremely high rates as compared to their peers. They're doing better on the SATs. More of them are taking the SATs. They are mm -hmm. accepted into more colleges. Um, and doing better on SATs by about 41 points on average, so a significant amount. Um, and similarly with world languages, we're seeing that that investment has really paid off. We started five years ago investing in elementary world languages. Um, we are now, for the third year in a row, the highest AP um, content area in terms of students receiving passing exams. Uh, and then we also have seen increased enrollment. So that's not just because a few students are taking it. We had a 26 percentage increase in the number of students last year to this year. Um, we are also seeing that students who receive world language instruction in middle schools are doing uh, better on park ELA scores when you use propensity matching. So mm -hmm. um, we're very excited to be f having these outcomes for our students first and foremost, mm -hmm. but also to be able to share that um, nationally so that other districts and states can start to look at this and start to share with their leadership. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are um, envious of those numbers um, <laughs> and excited to hear about that those initial outcomes. You've only been at this, what, four years? Yeah. Um, what was that initial investment and how, what's the long-term um, process for your evaluation and, and building of resources around this work in DC? Sure, so in, by investing you mean in terms of the costs. Mm -hmm. So it was a $2 million uh, for the first year. Um, we figured out some cost savings. So that first year we sent 380 kids abroad at $2 million. We've hovered around $2 million each year. Um, but we've increased the number of students. So we sent 420 last year. We're getting close to 470 this year. Mm -hmm. um, so we figured out where are the areas that we can save some money as we figure out our, our processes. It's very important to note that by fully funded, I mean that whatever student needs that you're provided with. So if a student needs a suitcase, we purchase a suitcase. If they need a passport, we provide a passport. Mm -hmm. We're very proud that we have to date provided over 800 passports to our students. Um, because the passport and the suitcase, they have that well after they get off that plane with us. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something in their software yeah. and in their closet. In terms of our long-term sustainability, um, after the first two years of private funding, we rolled over to local funds. So this is now funded by DC city government. This is all local dollars, um, and that is at times a challenge for my incredible team in terms of procurement and contracts, um, <laughs> but they're very dogged about it, um, and they're making it work, and, uh, and that is where we think the story really starts to change because it becomes something that we can share with other cities and say mm -hmm. this is a, an investment our city made. It's not just magic money. Mm -hmm. It's something that we decided we want to, wanted to do because it is improving learning outcomes. Yeah. So partnering with government agencies certainly important. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other partnerships that uh, each of you have seen work really well as it relates to this work or things that um, you know, have really assisted 
you in preparing your students for this kind of global educational experiences? Let me think a couple things for Freel and a Global Scholar. Um, you know, getting, getting grants from a variety of foundations, um, you know, Title VI centers that have a mandate from the federal <laughs> government to promote global education have been a longtime supporter. Um, the Longview Foundation has been a great friend <coughs> of us. Um, my colleague won a Farmers Insurance Teachers Dream Big Award, um, and that became money that became utilized in developing student, uh, two global student summits, one that we held here in the fall, one that we held in Champaign in the spring, also the development of training materials. So some of those types of grants, um, also promoting an Illinois Waterway Cleanup Week that we wrote a Senate joint resolution for and it helped fund small groups and providing resources, developing of kind of watershed literacy training materials. So a variety of different things, um, but always kind of looking for, yeah, two million would be great. Um, but, <laughs> it, was, but, it was nice. <laughs> but right, looking for those kind of things, but also, you know, in, in that Illinois Global Scholars is something that um, the, the legislature of Illinois passed and the governor signed. So any school district in Illinois can opt in to then award this on the state transcript for their, on the school transcript for their student who meets the, the you know, meets the criteria. Um, so one, if you're from different districts, please, as a constituent in a district, go to bat for this, if this, uh, if you wanna talk with me more about that. But it's those kind of, in a sense, as it was teacher driven, we also feel like there's a lot of grassroots people that think this is something we need for our students and to promote that. Um, we're looking for champions in schools and districts that realize, hey, this is valuable, and we want to embed this opportunity in our, in our curriculum for our students. So. And it's free for those districts. And it's right. We, it, investment of time, We think it's value course, added, but, and it's yeah. honestly imperative to bring a, a richness to life. Um, but there's not a lot of cost to it. You might need a little more in, in terms of resources, but fundamentally, um, a school can move forward very quickly on this. Yeah. Katie, any partners in your... Yeah, I would have to say um, QFI, Qatar Foundation International, mm -hmm. has done a lot of work with Limbloom in terms of sending students abroad, um, helping fund. We just had like an Arabic cultural day where we had students from local elementary schools come and they were getting henna and they were, mm -hmm. you know, learning um, like a certain type of dance and that sort of thing. Um, so they've certainly been a great supporter of, of our student, particularly our world language department. Um, and I would say any other organization that believes in the power of travel and the power of, of sending not just students but teachers abroad. Um, I know CIEE uh, is an organization that a lot of my students travel abroad through and I've actually done two of their faculty seminars as well. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's just a matter of, of making those connections. I think mm -hmm. like the opportunities are there. but. Um, Kind of getting the word out. And is Global Glimpse connected with? Yes, right? oh yeah, it's Global Glimpse. Great yeah. organization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's connected Absolutely. with Chicago Public Schools. Yeah, cool. Um, so we're going to turn to audience Q and A in a moment. So get your questions ready, or feel free to add them to the conference's I/O system, which uh, you can see on the screens. Um, but access to global education. So not just travel programs, but schools that might not have um, robust world language programs or um, schools that might be in more rural areas. What are the ways in which we can ensure access to districts and schools um, ac really across all kinds of, the, the, the rich geography and demography of our, of our state? I mean, I, we wrestle with that question, mm -hmm. right? I mean, just to, to be straightforward, that is, we don't want Illinois Global Scholar to be something that is <coughs> simply a, an AP add-on um, or just a suburban thing or anything like that. Um, so that's a question we continue to wrestle with, um, knowing that, for instance, if you need eight globally focused courses, as the, the rules in the legislation state, uh, hey, that could language could be a part of that. But 60% of districts in Illinois don't offer four years of language. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of equity, that becomes a challenge. Um, but I think sometimes you think, well, a, a poorer or rural community has to go global to understand global. And I think also if we sometimes open our eyes, there's a lot of global that's local. Yeah. And so those kind of experiences and globally focused service learning, they're awesome when they're abroad. And they're, I mean, they've been transformative in my life and, and 
obviously in, in what's gone on with, with the cold Ike program. Um, but I think they can also be transformed when they're local and students catch mm -hmm. a, the lens of somebody else who maybe they sit next to in class but don't realize the different narrative of their own kind of cultural community or socioeconomic status or anything like that. So I think there's, sometimes it's just taking a step back and finding maybe a new perspective mm -hmm. to provide those opportunities of, of access. Yeah, I think to add to that, I, I can't speak for your state, but I, I can speak to DC. And, and while we have sort of an array of programs and we're very lucky in that, Global is not happening in an entirely, you know, equal way in every single school, right? right. It's going to be, mm -hmm. it looks very different because every school has very different demands depending on where you are in our city. Um, and we certainly have high schools that are not going above level two world languages right now. And so, it, you know, depending on your geography within DC, you may go well beyond AP level or you may be in level two as a senior. Um, and that's something that, you know, we struggle with a lot and we try to figure out how can we make sure that that does not then lead to preventative um, programming, you know, with world languages, we've connected that very much to our study abroad program. We had a particular requirement. We had to be very aware of making exceptions to that requirement to ensure that we were being equitable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the important thing, this has been important for our team, and I think it's important when we have conversations with other teachers and districts is it's really okay to start small, right? Global at a school could be one teacher participating in an embassy adoption program. It could be a second grade ELA teacher bringing in a virtual exchange experience for her students. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's sparking that piece, it's celebrating that story, and it, it, from there it can start to grow because I think what we have seen is inherently um, the value is recognized by administrators, by educators, by parents, mm -hmm. by students. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it can feel very overwhelming to feel like you have to teach all of right. the globe and all of the world, right? None of us are a walking CAA fact book, but I think if you can feel empowered around the fact that you're just exploring the world with your students, you don't need to know all things and you don't have to have a $2 million travel program to be a globally competent district, um, you can be infusing some global texts in your classroom and, and yeah. really start to get there. Yeah. Excellent. Wonderful. Let's open it up to the audience. Any questions? Sure. Julie? Uh, Let's, uh, sorry, wait for the mic. There you go. Oh, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts on this wonderful program, and uh, I'm going to put in a word for virtual exchanges because that's a low-cost alternative yep, yep. that brings students together very in very lively uh, encounters. And Katie, you probably have sat in on Fadi Abugush's yeah. classes uh, with the Moroccan kids, um, and uh, we came to be part of that through the Sister Cities program. The Casablanca Committee got a uh, grant from the Christopher Stevens Initiative, which is promoting uh, virtual exchanges for North Africa and Middle Eastern students. So um, I think uh, any kind of exchange is excellent. And the more you travel abroad, the more you realize how much other culture, other people and other cultures know about us and how little we know about other cultures. We're pretty stupid about a lot of countries, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But I think this is a wonderful opportunity for young people to really um, learn and become better citizens of the world. Thank you. OK, sure. Questions? There you go. Um, given the global trend toward fascism and nationalism, I'm wondering if any of your curricula in include an analysis of hatred and strategies for responding to it. Yeah, I can speak to, uh, I think it comes in in lots of ways. It comes in in the magic, hopefully, of a good teacher in a teachable moment taking advantage of a situation or something someone shares or something you've dis built in by design. Um, my colleague, Seth Brady, for instance, started this year, we've started a peace and conflict course. Uh, so he has had a semester with a group of students um, to, to walk them through scenarios. Of, it, it's great because I've heard him share, like, one of them was having a conflict with a friend and they stopped and they went through like the stages of processing he was talking about. I'm like, oh, that's learning. And it's trying to infuse some step back, take a breath, right? So I, I think one, there's opportunities where it's built in by design, even in a whole course, right? But I think also sometimes as teachers, we're looking for those opportunities in whatever the, the general curriculum is that we have. Um, and it's needed. I wholeheartedly agree with you question from uh, the online audience. 
how can students continue to receive a globally focused education outside of the classroom? So what are some outside of the classroom resources, either at home or, or at university? What are some things that you have seen work well? Um, I was just speaking to two of my students on the way here and they were talking about a camp that they went to. Guys, let me know if I'm getting this right. Um, I believe it was a language camp over the summer um, and the idea was that it was like a full immersion experience where they were supposed to be speaking Arabic um, mm -hmm. kind of consistently. So I think anything like that is a great opportunity too for them to spend their summers, not just learning the language, but getting to know students from across the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was gonna, I wonder if it was the Star Talk program that you all did, was it was uh, different? Uh, Concordia. Oh, oh, Concordia, yeah. okay, that's yeah, that's a great oh program. Gosh, um, and I think there are a lot of different immersion opportunities like that. Star yeah. Talk is a grant funded program that does um, it's a fully funded summer language immersion program that's mm -hmm. offered around the country. Mm -hmm. So that's a great way to work on it. Um, but I think going back to also the conversation around global is local. And so yeah. are there globally focused organizations that you can intern with? Mm -hmm. um, are there opportunities to work with a church group or a temple that might be hosting a refugee family mm -hmm. and learning together with them about what it is to welcome people? Um, I think it's you know I think it's very particular to the context of, of where a student lives, but I think that those opportunities really exist, and and virtual mm -hmm. exchange is a great opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of different opportunities um, and platforms that will allow you to experience mm -hmm. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. a few that I know well. Um, I, I know the Red Cross clubs have lots of international opportunities as well as UNICEF or is that, uh, mm -hmm. Concern Worldwide. There are a lot of uh, nonprofits and NGOs that are doing work outside of the classroom, working with with um, high school students. Um, other questions from the audience? Sure. In the back there. Do you encourage American students to travel abroad with programs like AFS or Rotary, or there's a slew of them that mm -hmm. seems like that would be really good for them and, and reciprocal students coming here? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I've had a few students and the more I've kind of talked about my experiences, I've had some students come to me for advice or sometimes, you know, hey, can you talk to my mom about, because I want to go to Morocco and <laughs> mom's a little worried. And I was like, yes, I'm 32, so is mine. It's going to be okay. <laughs> um, they just, you know, as she worries I'm in Chicago even, like yeah. it's too far from Michigan. So I think that um, I definitely would encourage and have encouraged like any of my students to seek out those opportunities. Um, and I, I think it's great. I, I know of fewer that welcome students here, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that too. Yep. Yeah. There's a coalition called the Building Bridges Coalition, which is a lot of these kinds of exchange programs getting together and trying to uh, ensure that there are US students both at the high school and college level um, experiencing life abroad for a time. Um, so sometimes they're volunteers, sometimes they're paid, but that's a great, they have a great list of reputable organizations that send folks abroad. And regarding Rotary, um, I mean, my colleague and I have worked with the local Naperville Rotary group, and we have two sister cities, but trying to help facilitate, hmm, how can we have a broader cultural exchange that also involves <laughs> students in terms of those sister cities? So I think there, through Rotary, for instance, there's some great, you know, as you mentioned, some great opportunities yeah. to have that kind of here in the U.S. with Sister Cities Contact is another way to promote that exchange and those opportunities for students. Another question from our online audience. So how have you convinced school administrators to resource and give priority to this area of work? Um, <laughs> the, you passed state legislation. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's one simple answer is it suddenly became a lot more compelling um, when the state superintendent of education sent out um, you know, his, his newsletter and mentions only Global Scholar and people start contacting us. Um, so, I mean, that's one way is you, you work a legislative route. Uh, it's not a mandate and we didn't want it to be. Um, we really, we've promoted it as an opt-in opportunity uh, and that's what really what we think it is. Um, it gave, a, it, 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 our district initially when we wanted it just as a, a micro example, like we want to have this as, as kind of, hmm, the pilot for the state. Our district actually originally said no. Mm -hmm. um, but they said, we're going to let you pursue, we'll, we'll, we'll help you and let you pursue it on a state level. Um, now they've been the first district opt in in the state. So I guess it came around full circle in a good way, at least for our narrative. Um, but that might be one example of how to do it. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think for us, it's um, there is a legitimizing factor of, of having sort of at the central level having um, these different programs and opportunities coming down because um, you know teachers have a lot on their plates and there's um, a lot of curriculum and content to get through. There are a lot of needs of our students. There's a teacher evaluation system that is often sort of at, in the back of their minds. Um, and so with all of those pieces, having an organization that is sitting at our central office that can say, actually, this is exactly how it connects to your teacher mm -hmm. evaluation system. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna really help you get to essential practice three if you are teaching in a globally competent classroom. Um, but our programs are not mandates either. We are world languages, so yeah. are part of our graduation requirements. But um, outside of that, it's opt-in. You know, we have schools that have adopted. We have eight ID schools. We have three global studies schools. Um, those are choices and those are models that they've chosen to use. Study abroad is not mandated, but we have every school that is eligible participating. Um, embassy adoption program, we have to turn schools away. We have a wait list. We have a tremendous wait list for both of those programs. So um, I think there's a, there's also a, a culture of competitiveness, right? If you see that the kids across the street are getting this opportunity, you want it for your kids. Um, and that's, that's not a bad thing. And I would also add that it's, it's vision. It's when a superintendent gets it, mm -hmm. or it's a champion in the school that can convince the appropriate stakeholders to, that this is, this is important and this is valuable, and developing these global competencies in our students makes a product that benefits our community and our state. When those champions stand up locally, that's, mm -hmm. that's an agent, they're agents of change. Yeah. And I think what we're gonna see from the feedback from people that attended our workshop earlier today in light of the, this year's first class of global scholars was the students are gonna be the mouthpieces that'll turn adults' attention to why this, mm -hmm. the, the compelling why is the result in the child. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's what'll sell it in the future. Um, and, the, and I hope there's gonna be that competition. That, yeah, they're doing that, I wanna do that too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. <laughs> cool, uh, one last question here. Um, Just go it, ahead and wait for the mic. Mm -hmm. Come on. Thinking of the issue from the different perspective, um, I, I know there are a lot of international organizations like AFS and Rotary um, and college programs, but I don't see a lot of immersion programs for high school students from other countries here. And maybe it's my lack of information, but that's another way to internationalize the community and um, programs. And I, I know people who need that kind of thing that kind of program here in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. And I really haven't seen much. Mm -hmm. Do you have any guidance in that respect? Well, we do have a great um, partner in World, Chic World Chicago. Um, so they're bringing inbound delegations um, all the time. And many of those folks are young people. Um, and a variety of different professional and pre professional um, opportunities. So I would definitely say World Chicago. And you can always host a visitor. Um, in your home if you'd like, um, or host them for dinner. There's lots of different ways. And they've been at, uh, at the table with us in the stakeholder meeting and planning. Um, so that's one good resource. I know um, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, you know, we really see our role as um, highlighting the best practices that these innovative teachers um, have had and really sharing best practices and increasingly sharing the curriculum and the units and the um, you know, the school partnerships and the uh, formalizing school partnerships and what those MOUs look like, really trying to do that with the, the educator community that's involved here um, at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. So um, students and teachers can always come to our programs um, and you can reach out to me directly or any of the Cold Light Global teachers um, for more information about how to do that easily and swiftly. So thank you uh, to our panel. Um, I definitely want to thank Pat and Mike Koldyk for their vision and leadership of uh, this program and for all of their support. Just really enjoy having you here today, Mike, and um, being able to have this conversation has been just fulfilling for, and personally rewarding for me. Before we're going to start our networking reception, which I hope you'll all stay for, um, I'd like to introduce the class of 2018 Cold Lake Global Teachers, whom we have just announced. Um, so we don't have everyone with us, but uh, Carrie Bolnick, who is the teacher at Farragut Career Academy, and Michelle Boyle, who, and just go ahead and stand up uh, when I say your name, mm -hmm. who's a teacher at Whitney Young um, Magnet High School, mm -hmm. Joanna Fernandez, who's a teacher at Benito Juarez Community Academy, um, Heather Kelsey, 
who's a teacher at Our Lady of Tepic High School, and Annalisa Searcy, who is a teacher at Northside College Prep. So thank you so much. <laughs> such an honor to learn and, and to co-learn with them uh, throughout this process. So thank you to everyone here. Please do stay. The bar will be open until 7 o'clock, and I know our panelists will be anxious to answer any of the questions that we didn't get to um, as well. So thank you so much. All righty. Good job.